Welcome to the PewterCast. This is the second installment of the Instant Cast, talking about Redskin versus Bucks. I'm Brent Allen, your host. You are Bucks fans if you're listening to this, and if not, then you ought to be. Uh, well, hey, listen, fans, I just finally got done watching the Redskins versus Bucks game from the other night. Uh, it is Saturday afternoon, and I was out uh, really this week. I was out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then um, got got in really super early this morning, which is why I've not had a chance to uh, get anything out there. And some of you might have seen my tweet go out saying I really need to take my, my podcasting gear when I'm out on the road so that I can, you know, because I'm, I'm in hotels and different places where I do have Wi-Fi. So uh, I, I just need to take it with me so I can I can do this when I'm out. But uh, trying to get something out there before I head out on the road again and just wanted to uh, take a few minutes and really just talk about this game. I thought about skipping over it. I know we're several days after the game, and I know that the the initial fifty three is in. Um, you know, for the the cuts that they've made, there. You know, you can look at Twitter right now as I'm recording this and see all kinds of trades happening around the league. And you know, some of you guys are already asking me, "Hey, do you think we should go get this guy, or do you think we should sign that guy?" And you know, here's the thing: for this instant cast, I'm going to set that aside, and that's going to come up in episode number ten, which hopefully should be coming very much on the heels of this instant cast. Hoping to make that happen, but uh, I'm going to set that aside and really just kind of focus on the final preseason game. Now, let's talk about the instant cast just for a minute. I want to say thank you to everyone who has been sending in reviews uh, over to iTunes. Now, here's what we've said. We set out a goal where we said we wanted to get 25 iTunes reviews. This is our first season broadcasting, our first season recording. And so uh, a part of getting this thing launched right, this brand new podcast, is to get a bunch of iTunes reviews out there, which just helps other people find us. Um you know, especially now that the season is here. So he said 25 by the end of the preseason slash beginning of the season. And if we did that, we would unlock a special episode that I'm going to do every week during this season uh, called the instant cast, which is basically we'll watch the game. And as soon as the game is over and I can get to my recording equipment, I'll turn around and put out an instant cast where we talk about the game and just give those initial impressions. Uh, and that'll that'll give us something that really, as soon as the game's over, we can all just kind of grab onto. And uh, then later in the week, we put out a full episode. So uh, that's what we're doing. It takes 25 to get us there. We were at 15 last week, and we are now at 23. So guys, thank you so much to those, I guess, eight of you who have sent in reviews and rated us. We just need two more. So come on, guys. I know we can do it. We just need two more. We'll get to that 25. We can unlock it. So last week we did a preview of an instant cast. This one is a preview of an instant cast as well. Uh, and here's my question. Who's going to be the final two to put us over the top? Is it you? It could be. All you have to do is go over to iTunes, leave a rating, leave a review, and it'll count. It'll be great. I'll see it, and we're going to read them on air. We're going to read them during our main episodes, and uh, we'll unlock this instant cast for the season. Sound good? All right, folks. Well, let's go on. Let's talk about the game. Uh, my overall thoughts on the game, I have really just one sentence. It was a rather unremarkable game. Um Wow, this game. Yeah, man, this was it was just such a weird game coming off of the the Browns versus Bucks game. You guys remember that one? It's the one where our starters went out and they played, you know, for the first half of the game. And uh, it was really the only part of the game that that truly truly mattered. And uh, you know, this game it was just a waste. You know? I I I mean, you know, and and I'll tell you what actually happened. There's a player that could have made the 53. Um, in Bernard Reedy, in Bernard Reedy, who he actually could have, he could have made the 53. I could have seen that happening or at least making the practice squad. And he's now waved injured. Hell, Dante die, who, who was a guy that I was very, very high on. He got injured in the, in the Browns game, which, you know, if you're going to get injured, that'd be the one to get injured in. But I mean, my God, it's, it's just preseason. It's just such a waste, and oh man! And I know you guys felt it too. I saw you guys out on Twitter all weekend. I, you know, I watched. I watched the game kind of piecemeal over the course of the last several days, and uh, I actually got to sit down earlier today and just watch it all the way through. And and man, it was just hard. It was bored. Did anybody else feel bored during this game? Hey, there just wasn't much to watch. wasn't much to talk about. So. That's kind of my overall thought on the game, but there are a few players that stood out to me. There are a few plays, a few players that stood out to me. So uh, why don't we at least address those? And uh, we'll do this. Listen, I know by now, if you guys are listening to this, you have already heard about the 53 man, uh, you know, the 53 man cut. And I'm just so you guys know, I'm calling this the initial 53 because the truth is, 
you know, the team's going to be, they're going to cut more guys. They're going to add more guys. They're going to sign guys off waivers, which means they have to release guys. And then they're going to turn around and there's the practice squad. And it's really not going to be until what second, third, fourth week of the season before the team really gets set. I mean, they're going to be there. There's going to be lots of moves. So this isn't the final 53 man roster. This is just the initial 53 man roster. And I hope as, as coach cutter, and Jason Light brought in all those players that they just released, that they actually emphasize that to him. Guys, this is just the initial 53. They may be back. I mean, you look at a guy like Jeremiah George, who he was cut in the initial 75 when they did that, and now they've turned around, and they signed him like two days later. And I think he was actually one of the 53 men cut. So anyway, as you guys are listening to that, uh, that, that initial 53 has already been there. So we'll kind of talk about some of these in light of that. Um as we go through, there's there's no reason to to pretend that that part doesn't exist. Um, so I have one player that I do want to stand that that, I, that really stood out to me. It's actually probably the player who stood out to me the most in this entire game, and it's a player who didn't even play. It's a player who didn't even dress for the game. It is the face of our franchise, quarterback Jameis Winston. And you know what stood out to me about him? He was out warming up with the team even though he wasn't dressed. He was out there in the rain. He was getting beat on and pummeled by that water. I, now, listen, guys, I'm not in Tampa. I wasn't in Tampa that day. I don't know if it was if it was a cold rain. I don't know if it was a warm rain. I, I don't know. But what I know is, is he was out there getting wet, getting drenched. He didn't have a rain jacket on. You know, he wasn't huddled up under a, under an umbrella. His brothers in uniform were out there getting ready to play that game, and he was there on the field with his troops even though he wasn't going to be playing that night. Now, he could have stayed up in the press box in a nice, warm, cozy, dry place and eat some food, and I'm sure that's probably where he watched the game from. But when the team was out there warming up and he could get on the field with them, he was out there warming up with them. And that, guys, that's leadership at its finest. And that is the thing that, you know, even for these guys who several of them made the team and several of them got cut, he was still there with his troops leadership at its finest. I loved it. It was probably to me the 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 best thing about the whole game. I loved seeing that. It's it's part of what it is to have a changing culture, to go from a culture of losing to a culture of winning around Tampa Bay. So Jameis Winston, he stood out. Um but let's go over let, let's just start with the quarterbacks. Uh Mike Glennon. Um my my note here says this is what I've been talking about this preseason. You know, people keep talking about Mike Glennon being the starting caliber backup, that that we are the envy of the league for having a guy as good as Mike Glennon as our backup. And that, you know, everybody should be calling us, asking us about Mike Glennon services, you know, especially when, you know, you got Teddy Bridgewater going down, you know, the the Broncos still kind of have a an iffy situation, though I hear their guys actually doing pretty good. Um you know, you've got, uh, what was it? Romo went down a couple weeks ago. There's, there's just a few quarterback needs that are out there and, you know, people should be just beating down our door for Mike Glennon. Or, or if you, even if you go back to the draft, people are like, Oh, they should, we should be trading Mike Glennon for a second round draft pick. It's time to trade Mike Glennon. Tried to time to trade Mike Glennon. And I said, I said way back at the beginning of the preseason, I want to, I want to see this in Mike Glennon. I really do. Cause here's the deal. Mike Glennon, we've not seen him since preseason last year. Not under the lights, not under the lights. And, uh, you know, I thought he looked pretty good uh, a couple games ago. You know, I thought he looked looked really good. What was that? Was that the Jags game? I think it was. Um, you know, he looked really good. But, man, that first game against the Eagles, he just looked sloppy. He looked really sloppy. I don't I don't remember him super impressing me during the Browns game. And in this game, um, in this game, oh, man, it just, he looked like he didn't want to be out there. You know, I mean, did anyone else notice that he just just didn't look like he really wanted to be out there? I mean, it, you know, and and it just doesn't look good. Now, maybe he's a great backup. Maybe that's what he is supposed to be. You know, maybe he's a good backup and that's it. And maybe it's time to call it what it is and free up a roster spot by not keeping three quarterbacks. You know, the only reason we're keeping three quarterbacks is because we're we, we've convinced ourselves that it, at, at next year when Mike Glennon becomes a free agent that uh, w- the best we could do is re-sign him as a backup, but he's going to want to go somewhere else where he could potentially actually play a starter, start a role. But what if nobody signs him? What if nobody calls him? What if, what if? I mean, it doesn't look like it's happening because you assume that, that Mike Glennon 
you know, everything that we hear is, is no, they've not taken any calls about him. Nobody's calling, which tells me this, there's no market for Mike, for Mike Glennon. You, you know, yeah, there's teams that need a quarterback, but there's not a market if they're not calling, calling for him. Yeah. You know, and let's look at his play. I mean, I mean, seriously, did he look great to you guys? Did he more than that? Did he look like he commanded the troops while he was out there on, on Wednesday night? It didn't look like it to me, you know, and maybe, and you could, you could say, well, he's playing with the backup guys, you know, he's playing with the number twos, but I don't know. Like it just, it's just not flying with me. You know, and here's the thing, like he, lo- he loses that for that football at the end of the first quarter. You know what? It's a wet ball. It happens. Okay. I- I'm not going to give him a whole lot of sight. Now it looked funny. Oh, it looked hilarious. You, you put that out there as, is like a, like a GIF or a gif or however you want to say it and uh, you have that out there it, oh it's hilarious oh it's absolutely hilarious there's another spot where he throws a ball uh, i think it was uh, towards the end of the second quarter he throws a ball it should have been an interception because he literally hit the defender in the face mask like he threw it right into the guy's face i mean now that's inexcusable okay that's that i have more of a problem with that than i do about him running out there in the middle of rain with a wet ball and it slipping out of his hand as he goes back because you know what ryan griffin did the exact same thing yeah it, it just happens you guys ever play ball i played ball i played rain games that's that's what a rain game is that's that's part of what makes it uh that's part of what makes it fun is because you get wacky stuff like that happening so i don't know i mean that's that's really what i'm saying now i'm not saying that we should cut mike glennon i'm not saying that we should trade mike glennon mike glennon might be a fantastic backup but maybe we actually start treating him like a backup rather than treating him like a starter who is in a backup role because you know ever since mike glennon came here he's been the quarterback of the future right i mean he was drafted by shiano and uh who we have we had freeman that year and and Freeman was gonna he was gonna continue to he was supposed to be the 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 franchise quarterback for years to come, and he was kind of looking like maybe he wouldn't be. So we had Mike Glennon and he was the quarterback of the future. And then everything blows up with Freeman and, and Glennon comes in and does fine. You know, I mean he he kind of held his own in a real crazy situation, and um, you know and then Shiano gets fired and Lovey comes in and Lovey carries he picks up the banner of he's the quarterback of the future. Mike Glennon's the quarterback of the future. But we're not going to play him that year. They go out and they get Josh McCown, who's a great guy. But I don't know that he's any better of a quarterback than Mike Glennon. Or maybe he is. I mean, you know, maybe Mike Glennon really, he's the quarterback of the future because he's not the quarterback right now. And uh, maybe he's not that starting caliber quarterback. And then the very first thing we do after that season is we go draft a new face of the franchise, Jameis Winston. Mike Glennon is not our quarterback of the future, guys. He never really was. Yeah, I don't know why we kept calling him that. Um, so I don't know. That's all I'm saying. You know, it, it, it just, it reinforced for me the idea that Mike Glennon is not a starting caliber back is not a starting caliber quarterback. I just don't think he is not right now. And maybe it's just because he's been in a situation where he's never been allowed to develop into that. That could be it. But I do like Mike Glennon as a backup and you know, if he's going to be a backup and maybe we can actually talk about keeping him as a backup, then we can just cut the third roster spot and and uh just move on so we're so we're not taking up valuable space on the roster uh that's that's my impression that that's what i was thinking the entire you know well he was in for almost a half like he was in for like a a quarter and a half Uh, i was thinking that in the entire time but let's talk about the guy who came in after him ryan griffin um you know he had an opening pass to asj which was a tipped ball and then turned into an interception uh, he lost the ball just like Glennon did earlier. So, um, you know, it happens with wet balls. It, it, all right, guys, no dirty jokes. No, no dirty jokes. Don't say that. It just it happens when your football is moist. No, you can't. Guys, don't. No dirty jokes. No, no. We're 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 a, we're a PG thirteen PG show here uh, at the Pewter Cast. So, um, you know, Ryan Griffin. I mean, that, that's all I can say. I, I I can't even give you an impression of the guy. I mean, he's just. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, he, he looks like a backup and, uh, he looks like a practice squad backup, honestly. 
Uh, Peyton Barber, you know, I didn't think Peyton Barber looked great. You guys remember me saying what I liked about Peyton Barber was he was a different kind of running back. You know, uh, like Doug Martin and Mike James are kind of a smash through, break the tackle, break the hold, kind of a quarterback, uh, uh, kind of a running back. And uh, Barber's like the squirrely guy. He can do these spin moves and get away. He's got great speed. He just he just didn't look as squirrely. It's like he was trying to be too much Doug Martin and not be himself. He was trying to be this the number one running back, which is the the smash through and bust through the holes, Doug Martin, rather than being the guy who gets around. And the offensive line wasn't really opening any holes for him. Like they they really weren't so he just I, he just didn't look great you guys all know that and I, I'm pretty sure uh, you know I think he got cut um, I have those papers here somewhere I'm not sure where what I did with them they're there let's see who got cut was Peyton Barber on that yeah Peyton Barber was on that he's number twelve he got cut um, you know so he just didn't look great Kenny Bell. Um, you know, Kenny Bell, he also got cut. And here's the thing. Kenny Bell, I, you know what I saw was I finally saw some fight in him. Finally, in game four, I saw some fight. There was one play where he caught the ball and he hit the ground. Nobody touched him. And there was no whistle. Or at least he didn't hear the whistle. And he got up and he kept running. And when he got up, he like booty bumped somebody in the face. And uh, he kept he kept running, which was great. You know, he was trying to make a play. He didn't hear a whistle. So he just kept going. You don't stop until the whistle blows. I thought it was great for him. But, of course, it was too little too late. Sorry, Kenny. Ah, man, you, you had a great tweet last night, by the way. I saw it um, where you thanked the organization and um, – Hey, keep keep fighting because you've got a lot of people in Tampa Bay that are Kenny Bell fans. You've got a lot of people that really want to see you succeed, my friend. So uh, keep fighting. And, uh, hey, listen, this is just the initial 53. You never know where you could land, maybe with another team, maybe back here with Tampa Bay. Uh, and, and I personally hope to see you back here because I would love to see you develop into something um, that, is, that is really great. Uh, let's talk about ASJ. All right, he, he was a big one. Here's the thing. ASJ played for the whole game. All right. And, uh, you know, and Cutter comes out and he says later that because he wanted ASJ to have extended playing time, you know, and and it, it, here's the thing. You could take that one of two ways. You could take that as he's not good and we need to get this this big, long look at him. You know, uh, he, we, we're really not sure. We're kind of on the fence. We're on the bubble with Austin Sphere and Jenkins. Or you could take it as, hey, this is a time to show what you got. This is a time where you you get this extended amount of time to just go out there and be dominant in your role. Because, listen, let's face it. Now, ASJ is a starting caliber tight end. He he is a number one level tight end. He's not a backup. You know, now he may be a backup. We may have some other people who are better. We may have some people who are who understand the system a little bit better. And so they're going to be ahead of him on the depth chart. But ASJ is pretty damn good. It, he really was, and and here's what I thought. I thought he was playing above the rest of his teammates for the vast majority of the game. Um, you know, I, I understand what Coach Cutter was doing. Sometimes as a leader, sometimes as a coach, you've got to just put your guys into a situation where they can win so they can go out and win, and I think that's what Cutter was doing here. He was giving ASJ the opportunity to go out and just win, and yeah, I'll tell you what, if you go back and you look at his numbers right now, it's not going to show it, but go back and watch him. He was always where he needed to be. He was sharper. He was faster. He made his cuts better. He was more on point. Now, he can't control whether or not Glendon or Griffin threw the ball to him. And, I, you know, he can't do that. But he was right where he needed to be. And here's the thing. I I don't know that ASJ really understood why he was out there. And that might that might have been a failure on the on the part of his coach. That you know, because that's part of something you have to do as a coach, as a leader, is you have to cast vision to people. You have to let them know why. And if they didn't actually let him know why, they just said, "Well, you know, Austin, you're going to be out there playing." And he's going, "Why? Why am I playing? Why? I'm not. I could get injured. It's raining out there, which means I could triply get injured. And and why are you going to put me out here playing like this? They, if they didn't cast that vision, which is which is what I suspect. Now I don't know. I wasn't there in those rooms, but I, that's what I would suspect. I could see ASJ really not understanding why he was out there. But on the backside of it, I do. I really do understand. And hey, you know what? Rain is a part of the game. So whether it was raining or not, it's really where they need to be. So uh, that was ASJ. That was my impression of everything that happened. And, you know, he rips his helmet off. He starts yelling at the coaches. And, and I have yet to see anybody tell us what was actually said in that time. 
my sense is, is he was yelling at them to take him out of the game. He was done. You know, does he need to prove anything more? Um, that that would be my sense. That would be my sense. And uh, they they just wanted to see him out there. So uh, the offensive line, uh, the offensive line stood out to me. And I'm going to about, talk about it as an entire unit. The entire offensive line stood out because no one stood out. It was just unremarkable. Like they, yeah, yeah, they, they, I mean, they were fine. You know, I mean, they, they, they were okay. I think they only allowed what one sack the whole game that was on Griffin and that was more Griffin's fault than it was theirs, you know, but I mean, no one stood out, but they also didn't make any holes that, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't excel at their jobs, but they didn't, they weren't complete crap either. You know, I, I, I was really sad to see, by the way, uh, Josh Allen, offensive lineman, get cut. Uh, he was the guy who filled in for Kevin Pamphill when when uh, he was out during the Browns and Bucks game. And I thought he did fantastic. And I was really, really sad to see him get cut because I thought he did uh, really tremendous in that job uh, and in that role. But I can also see why we might have cut him, you know, given that we have uh, Evan Spencer, uh, not Evan Spencer, Evan Smith as a guy who can kind of swing through that whole deal. And we have Kevin Pamphil and we still have J.R. Sweezy back on on the pup list who could be coming off. And, and of course, Ali Marpet, um, you know, that just puts him down on the list. Caleb Beninock, I think, is is uh, uh, I think he's probably more of a tackle, but I think they're trying him out at different spots. But I, I could see why he might have just he just might have been a victim to too many people, you know, but I was kind of sad. So. Anyway, that's the offense. Uh, as far as the defense, um, you know, let's talk about the line, the defensive line. Um, they could just could not block the run at all. I mean, even in a wet day, they could not block the run. You know, and I heard Ger Gerald McCoy was talking about this last week in, in some of the, the interviews that he gave, I think, during open locker room. Um, you know, he said coming off of the Browns Bucks game, the very, the very good Browns Bucks game, he said, we, we were crap at the run block. And we've got to work on that. We've got to work on that this season. He said the pass rush was okay, and and I think think that bared out even here. The pass rush was okay. The run blocking just was not good. Um, now I, I find it interesting. Bear in mind that the two games that Gerald McCoy, him, did not play is when the defensive line was underwhelming. You guys remember that? Remember how great the defensive line looked in that first game against the Eagles, and then they kind of yeah against the Jags, and then they looked awesome against the Browns, and now they're like eh against the the Redskins. So, you know, here's the thing. The defensive line was underwhelming, but I, it's got me wondering how much of an impact Gerald McCoy makes, not just because he's there as talent, but the leadership that he brings to that line. You know, there was this, this little thing that came out where Jameis came to Gerald McCoy and said, you've got to step up as a leader. You've got to be more vocal. And Gerald McCoy just said, it's not my preferred way of doing it, but I can do it. And if the face of the franchise is going to tell me that's what we need to do to win, then I'm going to do that. And if Gerald McCoy has really taken that upon himself, I could see that being an issue that when he's not there, there's a lack of leadership. You know, there was no juice, as Coach Cutter would say. So and now I, I don't know that that's the case, by the way, I want to qualify that. I don't know, but I, I'm just curious. That's something that I'm very interested to see. And I'm interested to see in the season as we go on when Gerald's on the field with the guys versus when Gerald's not on the field with the guys. I'm just really curious to see that. So, um, but yeah, the defensive line, just no one stood out there. Uh, I've, I have not a single linebacker to talk about. Not one in this entire game. They just didn't stand out to me. I'm sure there were some who had some great tackles. I'm sure some made some okay plays. But nobody stood out to me as I watched this game. No, not a one of them. So uh, I'm going to jump back to the cornerbacks. Uh, you know, I thought Josh Robinson, he had a big stop in the red zone. Um, a big third down stop. Just, just a huge one, which was great for him. I loved seeing that. And then he turned around and in the third quarter. He got beat in the end zone for a Redskins touchdown. I was like, oh, Josh. Uh, he's, you know, he's been battling it out with, uh, Jonathan Banks there, Josh Robinson. And, um, you know, I, I can't, I don't wish either one of them ill, but I always tend to root for the underdog and, and Robinson certainly would be the underdog in that. So, um, but as we also know, if you've seen the list, Josh Robinson, um, I believe he also was one who was cut. Um, oh, maybe not. Oh, did they keep him? Oh, looks like they keep him. Looks like they kept him. Oh, cool. Well, good for him. Uh, good for him. So, uh, Josh Robinson, 
Great that he's there. Jonathan Banks, uh, you know, he's a guy that a lot of people thought was going to get cut, but he's still on the team as of right now. We'll talk about uh, reasons why I think he might still be on the team. We'll do that in episode 10. Not for this right now. Uh, but Banks, you know, here's what I thought about Banks. I thought he was where he was supposed to be on the easy plays. That, that's really, he was right where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing when it was easy. It is kind of what it looked like to me. When, when the ball came his direction, when the ball went right to him, when the when the defender crossed right through his path or kind of in his zone, then then Banks was right there. But what I didn't see was any big plays. I didn't ever see him coming out of nowhere. Um, you know, there are times where, where we saw Brent Grimes come out of nowhere. We saw, saw Vernon Hargraves just coming out of nowhere. I never saw Jonathan Banks doing that. Um, he almost looked lackadaisical, which kudos to me. I love using that word. Um, almost like he's just resigned to being off the team. Not a guy who's battling for a spot, which is ironic because he still has his spot. Um, but I'll say this, and and I am I'm I 100% will say this: if he really is just resigned to being off the team and he's not going to battle for it, he's not going to go out there and 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 battle to win it. I don't want that on our team. That is not a culture of winning. That's not. It's not a culture of winning. If that's really what he was, and I, I'm not one to sit here and assign motives to a man. I'm just kind of saying what I saw and then what I'm thinking because of what I'm seeing. All right. Now, it, it's up to Coach Cutter and the the cornerbacks coach and for Jason Light to suss out whether or not that is actually what's going on. Um, but I, I don't want that kind of um, I don't want that kind of mindset on this team. You know, I, I don't care how talented you are. If you're just resigned to something and you're not going to go out and battle for it, I don't I don't want that infecting our locker room. Now, let's talk about a bright spot for Banks. Um, you know, he almost had that interception at the end of the second quarter, at the end of the first half, and and it was just rainball. It just slipped through his hands. Um, I, and I don't know that he would have caught it anyway, but still, he was in position. Um, and, and uh, you know, so that that's a bright spot. I remember watching that just going, oh, hey, look at you, Banks. Yeah, you were right there. Good job. Um, could man, it would have been awesome for you if you would have had that. It, it would have been awesome for our team. Uh, but I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. I, I just don't know that he's really had it in him since he wasn't named one of the top four cornerbacks on the team since he didn't get that nod. So, um, yeah, I don't know that that's, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what comes out of Jonathan Banks. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to, to bash the guy. I'm not a person who does that. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Uh, talk about my MVP of the night, Jude Ajay Barima. Hey, Jude. Uh, you know, he was the only one, and I'll say this, uh, outside of uh, Austin Severian Jenkins, I thought he was the only one who truly looked ready to play like he could be a day one starter. You know? Um, I, I mean, ASJ really could, but he's got some other people in front of him, but, but Judah J. Barima, I thought he played really, really well. He was another guy that the coach, you know, I think he, you know, he's really been a lock for this team, but the coaches wanted to give him some longer playing time. He played almost the entire game and he took advantage of longer playing time, whereas ASJ didn't. Uh, and I got to tell you, um, I can relate to that. I, you know, I personally relate to that as a, as a comedian. I, I got to tell you, it's really hard to challenge yourself and to get better when you're only doing seven minute sets, 10 minute sets, 15 minute sets. It's really hard to actually get in there and, and challenge yourself and to, to see how good you can actually be to see how fast you can be and how, how, uh, and by fast, I mean, how fast to the next joke, uh, you can be, uh, you know, the challenge really comes in the longer times. You know, how do my transitions work? How do I hold up? You really get to see what you are as a comic. You get to see, you know, great. I know this bit works here in this situation. I know this works here in this situation, but what do I do when I've got this big, long situation? What do I do when I've actually got to get out there and do this for real? And I think it's the same thing in football. You know, you can go out and you can do these little, you know, these little plays here. I'm going to run this series or these two series, you know, during the preseason. I, you know, I'm going to run these little things, uh, the, these little these little routes. I'm going to run this little set of plays. That's one thing. But, man, when you're somebody who's going to go out there and you're going to be out there for the whole game, that's a different challenge. Do you have the stamina to play for the whole game? Do you can you keep the intensity up the entire game? Can you stay healthy the entire game? So th that's where the real challenge is. And I thought Judah J. Barima rose to that uh, beautifully. I loved seeing that. I'm glad to know that he's still on the team. Uh, Brian Anger, 
Uh, not to his, not, not anything that he did, but he got a crap ton of practice in tonight. I mean, um, I don't know how many three and outs we went. I don't know how many times he punted, but, uh, here's what I can say. If you ever seen like a, like a baseball pitcher, like his arm, when they ice it after a game, I hope that's what they did to his leg or his hip or whatever. Um, cause he was just, I mean, he was just kicking that ball, kicking that ball, kicking that ball. Uh, I want to talk about somebody that we almost never get to talk about. You guys ready for this? And this stood out to me. I had this thought, and it really stood out to me. This is a player who gets almost zero recognition whatsoever, and it's Anthony DiPaolo, the long snapper. And here's the thing. He snapped the ball great all night, which I know, you know, kind of, oh, he snapped the ball really good all night long. But here's the thing. He snapped the ball a lot, and he did it in the rain. You know, I mean, I mean, think about that. It was raining all night. I, I, I think it kind of maybe led up towards the end of the game. But, you know, it, wet balls, bad terrain. And, and when you're in the long snapper spot, you know, that's a spot where, hey, ball's a little bit wet. You can send it, you know, you can you can run it along the ground. You can send it up over the punter's head. You could, it could just be a bad snap. And and nobody would really blame, well, yeah, we would blame you. But, uh, you know, uh, we would certainly understand. We'd give you a little bit more uh, grace, I suppose, than if it was just a dry ball. Um, so, guys, let's not overlook that. I mean, I mean, you know, hats off, tip the hat to, to our long snapper. Uh, that was great. And then, um, and then you guys know, of course, it was great to see Roberto Aguayo being a hundred percent. He was another guy that I think kind of in that same, same bucket as Judah J Barima and, um, ASJ and that he needed more time on the field. We needed to put him out there to see what he, to see what he could do and just give him the time to get out there and just keep going and keep going and keep doing what he has to do. Uh, of course he would not have had a choice because he is our only kicker in this game. Uh, are on this team so he didn't he had to play but uh i think it was good for him to play so good for him um so that's really what we have we're coming up here at the end oh wow this is already a 30 minute uh podcast so we'll have to uh cut this a little bit uh closing thoughts uh guys let's talk about the rain here's the deal rain is part of football it is a part of football you can only blame the rain for so much now rain may have been a reason for things to be harder, rain may be a things for thing a reason for things to be more difficult. That may be why you dropped a ball. That may be why you uh, why it slipped out of your hands, Michael Glennon and, and Ryan Griffin. But here's the thing: it's on you because you failed to overcome it. All right. Now listen, this game I think would have been way more beneficial for our first team players uh, since they're going to be the ones playing in the rain come the season. All right. Uh, you know, I, I don't think our guys really got to shine during that, but not all that notwithstanding, the elements are part of football. It's an outside game. All right. Whether it's it's 10 feet snow drifts or whether you're in the middle of a tropical storm, you know, um, it, it, here's the thing. I, and, and I do believe this. I think the rain affected more than just the field and the ball. I think for the Bucks, especially in a way that it didn't necessarily for the Redskins, but for the Bucks, I think it had a mental effect. You know, they just didn't look like they wanted to play that night. I don't know if they were worried about injury or if they were really worried about the worsening weather. Um, I mean, even the fans didn't really come out. You know, this game really didn't matter for most of these guys. Truth be told, the decisions of who that final 53, it feels like had mostly been made and only a really big performance was going to change it. You know, I think the Redskins came in and they had some stuff to prove and they said, bring it. And they were ready. And the Bucks just didn't look like they were ready to play. You know, and I can imagine that being in Tampa, you're seeing the weather roll in. And at any moment you're going, they're going to cancel this game. They've already moved it up, but it wasn't enough. They're going to cancel the game. They're going to what? What? We got to go out and practice. Uh, OK, uh, well, let's let's go. They're going to cancel the game. They're going to cancel the game. Oh, uh, what? We're going to go out for the for the coin toss there. Oh, all right. I guess we're really going to play this game. You know, I, so I think it can really have had that mental effect. I don't I don't know that they were ready to play mentally uh, because I don't think that they thought they might actually be playing. And I, I think that could be of what's happening. And you know what? That's on them. That's on the individual players. You can't coach that. That is on the players for uh, for not being ready. Um, you know, the offense couldn't stay on the field long enough to give the defense a break. You know, and the defense couldn't get off the field to give the offense another chance. Um, so... And that's it. Uh, 
Well, guys, I think that's going to do it for this instant cast, talking about the Redskins versus Bucks. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. I had to go ahead and get this out here because I'm not going to be talking about this game too much on episode 10, uh, where we're really going to be talking about the initial 53 and what that looks like. So uh, you guys be on the lookout for that coming up later this week. And in the meantime, go Bucks.